Well, good morning and good to see everybody here. And I just also want to thank uh, Natalia and Felicia and uh, Brooke and the many folks who are baptized. You know, the one thing all those stories have in common is each one of those people experienced God move because they said yes to Jesus. And yep, that's a really powerful thing. And all those stories were possible because so many of you said yes to praying and serving and giving. That's the thing, how this place called the church works. It's that we say yes to Jesus and we pour our lives out and we sacrifice and we wonder what's God gonna do. That's what he's gonna do uh, over and over and over. And I just wanna say a name for you right now, for those of you, especially for those of you who give financially, who sacrifice to make this kind of ministry possible, thank you for giving. And if you call North Shore home and you're not giving or you're not tithing, I just want to challenge you to pray about that because when you say yes to trust God in that way, God multiplies those resources and we get more stories like you've heard today. And we want to see more of those stories happening in the weeks and months and years to come. Uh, so you can find out more about that at northshore.church slash give. Uh, and I would just love for you to pray about that in your life. And before we dive into the message, let's just pray together as well. Uh, so Jesus, we are grateful for you today. We're so grateful for the work that you're doing in our church, the work you wanna do in and through us. Uh, God, thank you for um, this powerful gift that we have that we get to talk to you today and hear from you today. And so I pray, Jesus, that you would use my words uh, to communicate to each heart just what they need to hear today. So God, we are expectant and excited for the words you have for us. And we pray this in your name and everybody said, amen. amen. So as many of you know, we have a four-year-old son named Jude, and one of the things I've learned about four-year-olds is that they have this very unique trait uh, that I like to call the inability to refrain from asking for stuff. Any parents experienced this one before? The inability to refrain from asking for stuff. Uh, so I hear this all the time from Jude, Dad, can I have a snack? Dad, can I have that toy? Dad, can I skip bedtime? Dad, can I wear my Spider-Man outfit to school? Dad, do I have to wear any clothes to school? And you would think he would get tired or run out of energy, but he doesn't. He's so proficient at asking. He doesn't even really need a question anymore. He can just say, Dad, 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 Dad. Which brings me to what I wanna talk about with you today for just the next few moments. Uh, we're in this final week of our series called How to Unburden Your Life. And there's one more spiritual practice we're going to dive into that comes out of this amazing little letter called 1 John that John writes about in the closing remarks of that letter. So I'm going to read through our text for today. And what's going to be different is you're going to have this text on the side screens. When you see a word in red, we're going to say that word out loud together. All right. So this is John, uh, 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Uh, any guesses on what the practice is for today? Asking God. And so just for the next few moments, I want to kind of uh, leave with you or give you four really simple observations that come out of this text that you can take with you into your week. Uh, you can write these down if, uh, if you're taking notes today. And the first is a simple one like, uh, that goes like this. God wants you to ask. God wants you to ask. He wants you to bring your requests to him and just ask. What, you sh what should you ask for? Anything. God, I need a raise at work. God, I need money to fix my car. God, I have a family member who's really sick. God, help me fix this relationship. God, help me find a relationship. God, I need help. God, I need answers. Prayer, asking, starts with whatever is actually on your heart. Because here's the thing, and many of you have experienced this in your life or in your prayer life. If you don't start with what's on your heart, you'll eventually stop praying. A writer named Dallas Willard put it this way. He said, prayer simply dies from efforts to pray about good things that honestly do not matter to us. And isn't that so true? And many of you, again, you've experienced this kind of, I got to force myself to think about praying. And it's kind of this religious conversation with this God who feels kind of like a stranger. And eventually, inevitably, we just kind of give up. 
Years ago, I remember someone asking me, Scotty, if God were to answer every one of the prayers you prayed over the past week, tell me what would happen or what would happen. And my answer was, well, not a whole lot because I didn't ask God for much that week because I didn't think that what mattered to me actually mattered to God. But if you look back through the Bible, most, uh, most of prayer is just peeping, people asking God for the stuff they need. Jacob asked God to bless him. Hannah asked to have children. David asked for victory over his enemies. Solomon asked for wisdom. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, asked God to spare him from going to the cross. I love how the Apostle Paul put it. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In every situation, do what? Ask. In every situation, do what? Ask. Let's do it again. In every situation, do what? Ask. Honestly, it would be a really cool experiment in your life if you just t- tried to pray this next week like a four-year-old. Dad, 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 dad. Because God is your heavenly father. So what do you need to ask God for this morning? Where do you need to start asking? Hold that thought. I'm sure something quickly came to mind or maybe it's just been on your heart all the way through the message so far. Hold that thought. We'll come back to it in a moment. But God wants you to ask. He wants you to ask. That's the first take home from this text. Second observation for you to take with you today is simply this. God hears you when you ask. Doesn't just want you to ask and it's just sort of like this, you know, routine you're supposed to go through. God is actually listening. He hears you. It matters. John writes, if we ask for anything according to God's will, he hears us. He hears us. And one of the reasons I feel like we don't ask is because we have this theological paradigm or concept of God or this idea of God as having some unalterable cosmic blueprint up in heaven somewhere where everything's already determined. So why ask? And yes, God is all-knowing and all-powerful, but if you read the Bible carefully, you'll find that God's sovereignty doesn't mean he's not moved to act by our prayers and requests. God's sovereignty doesn't mean he cannot change his mind. And I'm not making that up just because I think it sounds better. This is actually in Scripture. I'm going to give you an example from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. There's this king named Hezekiah who gets really sick, and this prophet named Isaiah, some of you heard the name Isaiah before, goes and he tells him this. Look at this. This is what the Lord says. Pretty clear. Sounds like a blueprint to me. Sounds like this is going to be just the will of God. He says, put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Now, Isaiah was not a very good pastor. I don't think that's what you want to say to someone when they're on their deathbed, but he's a prophet. He's speaking God's will, right? Right? God's made it clear. Hezekiah is not going to recover. Look at what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. But see, God's mind already made up, right? Nothing he can do. The word's been proclaimed. Isaiah's already said it. He's on his way out of the building. You know, there's no possible way to change course, right? Look at what happens next. I love this. It says, before Isaiah had left the middle court, he's on his way out. God, the Lord, comes to him again. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, and I will heal you. And then God just goes up and and beyond. He gives uh, Hezekiah 15 more years to his life. Why? Because Hezekiah asked, and God was listening. God heard. You see, in God's great sovereignty, he has given you and me the power, the agency, the capacity to actually change the course of human history through what we ask. It's called intercessory prayer. That's the language you may have heard before. It's all over the Bible. And you see the power of people's prayer interceding and moving God to action throughout Scripture. There's a 4th century church leader named St. John Chrysostom. 
And he described it this way. I love this language. He says, the potency of prayer hath subdued the strength of fire. It has bridled the rage of lions, hushed anarchy to rest, extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burst the chains of death, expanded the gates of heaven, assuaged diseases, repelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course, and arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. And if that doesn't make you want to say amen in church, I have no idea what will. You see, the reason we can be confident in how we approach God with what we ask is because God is listening. He hears. He's moved by our hearts. He's moved by our asking. Just like I'm moved when my four-year-old says, Dad, 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 Dad. Now, I should pause here, and it's worth just noting, just to remind you, because I know some of where your minds are going, this does not mean we get exactly what we ask for every time we ask. Why? Well, one simple reason, logical reason, is because people ask for very different things, sometimes mutually exclusive kind of things. For example, Cody Pepper, our very gifted student pastor you heard from just a few moments ago, he is a diehard Houston Astros fan. I don't know how we missed that in the hiring process, but somehow we missed that. But when the Astros play the Mariners, Cody and I are praying for mutually exclusive outcomes, outcomes that can't happen at the same time. Both teams cannot win. And not only that, God doesn't actually always take sides with the stuff that we pray for. He doesn't pick sides, for example, in baseball games. He loves the Mariners, and he loves the Astros, and they're cheating little souls, right? I mean, he he loves everybody the same. But the main reason, and this is also really important that you understand this spiritually, the main reason, do you know why the main reason uh, we don't get everything we ask for is because our character is not yet ready to wield that kind of power. Think about it this way. If God answered every prayer you made, just think of what would happen when someone cuts you off in traffic, right? I mean, my prayer in that moment might make the world a better place for me, but it would not turn out well for those other drivers, Does that make sense? We're wielding incredible power that we're not yet ready or have the understanding to wield. C.S. Lewis described it in a much better way. He said, prayers are not always in the crude factual sense of the word granted. This is not because prayer is a weaker kind of causality, but because it is a stronger kind. When it works at all, it works unlimited by space and time. That is why God has retained a discretionary power of granting or refusing it. Except on that condition, prayer would destroy us. Because we're still learning what to pray for and how to pray. God doesn't answer every prayer, but God still hears us and he wants us to ask. Which leads to a third observation, and it's simply this. We are transformed as we ask. God wants us to ask, he hears us when we ask, and we are transformed as we ask. Remember what John said, that if God hears us, he hears us not just if we ask, but if we ask according to his will, according to his will. Now for me, that can feel like a problem because I often ask according to my will, my agenda, my plans, my desires. So how do we learn to ask authentically, start where we are, and then learn to ask according to his will at the same time? Seems like a paradox. Well, the way forward, and this is another really important principle in spiritual life, the way forward is not to try harder to have your heart match God's heart. The way forward is to start talking to God and relating to God like a friend. Like a friend. In the book of Exodus, the Bible describes God speaking to Moses as one speaks to a friend. So how do you speak to a friend? Openly, easily, vulnerably, recreationally, sincerely, safely, routinely, and most importantly, friends in their relating to one another, come to know each other's business. They come to know each other's heart, right? I hate to break it to you, but God is not your therapist, okay? Yes, he gives us wise counsel and direction, but here's the problem with that kind of relationship. A therapeutic relationship is a one-way relationship that's all about meeting your needs. And again, that kind of relationship is helpful in life. I have a great therapist who listens to me talk all about me, and it can be really helpful. But that's not a friendship. 
A friendship is a two-way relationship where you get to know each other. You get to know each other's hearts. You are moved by each other. And that's what God wants with us. This past summer when I was on a sabbatical, I sensed God asking me this question, Scotty, do you want to be friends? Not just, you know, employer, manager, employee, a manager-employee relationship, but do you want to be friends? And it was a kind of a wake-up call in my spiritual life. But what I've been learning since that time is God didn't ask me that question because he didn't know what was on my heart. He asked me that question because I had lost touch with his heart. Like I've lost touch with other friends that I still call friends. They're out there in the world. I know who they are, but I don't know what's on their heart today. I'm not in a conversational relationship with them today. That's why we pray. That's why we develop the practice of asking so we can grow in knowing God's heart, which will begin to transform who we are and what we ask for. Let me give you an example. So often prayers begin, and it's okay to begin with a simple prayer like, God, help me pass this test at school. Or God, help me get a better boss at work. And again, it's a great place to start. But over time, as you pray that prayer, as you have a conversation with God, as you get to know God's heart, you begin to evolve. Your prayers begin to transform. And instead of praying simply, God, give me a better boss, you start to have thoughts like this. God, help me be more patient with my boss. Or God, give me the courage to have that hard conversation with my boss. Or God, help me share your love with my boss. And not because you think you should pray that way, because it, but because you want to pray that way. God's heart is now on your heart. Because here's the thing, the more you talk to God, the more you will come to love what he loves. That's how friendship works. So just to sum up so far, God wants us to ask. He hears us when we ask. We are transformed as we ask. And then one final observation, and this may be the most important today, there is more power when we ask together. There is more power when we ask together. I want to read our text from 1 John one more time, and I'm going to highlight a different word for us this time to read out loud together. So this is, again, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Here we go. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Anybody else picking up what John's laying down in this part of the verse, right? There's power. Not just when we pray individually and privately, that's a great thing to do, but when we come together and pray together, and one of my favorite pictures of this in the Bible is in Acts 12 when this king named Herod has taken Peter, the great disciple Peter, and thrown him in prison. And the Christians in Jerusalem, they didn't have any power. They didn't have any political clout. They had no way to bail Peter out. So what did they do? Acts 12 verse 5 says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And then if you know the story, an angel of the Lord appears in that prison and tells Peter to get up and put on your clothes and begins to walk him out of the jail cell, walk him out of the jail all the way through town. Peter actually ends up at the house where the church was gathered that they were pray, where they were praying for him. And it's this amazing moment where he's like knocking at the door. They don't want to answer. One of the servants is like, I think it's Peter. And they're like, it can't be Peter. He's in prison. We're praying for him right now. Like, no, it's Peter. Let him in. They see him. They get so loud and excited. Peter's like, you got to be quiet. They're going to arrest me again and throw me back in jail. Friends, there's power when we pray together. God moves. When we're in here praying, he's moving out there in ways that you'll never know. You'll never see. Asking God to heal or help or restore. And I've seen this at work here in our church over the past few years. Last year, when we launched our Greater Things vision, we prayed together about that for five weeks and God moved almost $6 million he moved. And Mill Creek's just a few weeks, a few months away, which is awesome. The ministry and life change from the baptisms you saw today to the, move, uh, the ministry happening in Alpha and Mops and Midweek and Global Mission, they're not just fueled by great ideas and good strategy, but by earnest prayers being prayed every single day. The story you heard earlier about Felicia being healed from cancer, I remember standing on this very platform, a team of people surrounding her, praying over her body, and God moved and began to heal her of that cancer. So it's no wonder that when Jesus entered the temple and began clearing out the tables, he didn't say, no, 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 stop doing this. This is supposed to be a house of sermons or a house of classes. He said, no, 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 this is meant to be a house 
of prayer, of asking, of interceding, of moving the heavens to change the earth. God, your kingdom come, your will be done down here as it is up there. That is our job. That's why we're here. And that's the power in which you've been entrusted and it can change the world. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? We're going to uh, uh, work through this this week. Again, like normal, we have some practices online at northshore.church slash practices for you to engage in learning the practice of asking. But we're going to do something a little different right now because we're gathered, we're here. There's power in this place. So we're actually going to pray together. A little while ago, I asked you to think about something you need to ask for. And we're going to come back to that. We're going to start by asking God right now for whatever it is you want to ask him for. But we're going to do this differently. We're going to do this together. And I know this might sound a little scary. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But what I'm going to challenge you to do is just turn to a person around you, near you, chair in front of you, chair behind you. Don't have to stay with the person you came with or family. It could be someone you don't even know. And if you're not comfortable praying out loud, you can pray quietly together. God hears your heart. But this is where the church is called to exercise its great power in the world. Not out there through money or reputation or wealth or political clout, but right here, right here in these chairs, seeking God's heart and interceding for the stuff that matters. So here's what I want you to do. For the next few moments, just want you to turn to someone next to you and just, you don't have to tell them anything personal. You say, please pray for that part of my heart, what I'm asking God for, and let them pray over you and pray over them and ask God boldly, be confident in going before his throne as we pray together. So can we do that? You're looking at me like you're not going to. Well, I'm up here, you're out there. We're going to do it together, okay? So turn to someone next to you, pray, and then the team's going to come out and lead us in a closing song.